live from York, this is The Late Show with Christopher Valves. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're talking about neurodiversity and creativity with children's author Abigail Griebelbauer and artist and creative consultant Michael Magruder. So join us as we explore experiences of dyslexia in teaching and learning, neurodiversity as superpower, and how we might make the education system a better place. Live from York, this is The Late Show with Christopher Valls on Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live at tvradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello everyone and thank you for joining me this evening on the final weekend before A-level exams finish. In what seems to have been the longest examination seasons in recent memory, our Year 11 and Year 13 students have somehow managed to sustain their revision momentum through the wettest May and one of the warmest Junes some years too. The last month has seen the library full of mind mappers, flashcard consumers and quiz trios as a number of late science exams, maths exams, and the big two history exams finally came to a close at A-level. Our Year 11 students left us last week following the end of the GCSE exam season and are no doubt having a bit of a break while thinking over their subject choices for life in Year 12 in September. The AQA GCSE English language exams posed some nice challenges this year with questions focused on the animal world and on the benefits of public transport, they proved particularly popular with our students. Our Sick Form Poetry Society met for the final time as a group on Monday evening, with students reading a selection of poems linked by them of thankfulness and sharing a picnic together while reminiscing on their time at the college. Among those poets chosen by students for the final meeting were Mimi, Calvati, translator of the Persian poet Hafiz, Derek Mann, William Shakespeare, James Tate and Victor Hugo read in the original French. Regular Poetry Society members had invited along their friends for the evening and once the theology tower clock had chimed 10pm and the meeting had concluded in the usual way with the words of Psalm 41, our Year 13 students took themselves back to their boarding houses in the last remnants of the fading daylight. As is the case every year, the departure of our Year 11 students signalled the start of eternal exams for the other year groups. So this week I have spent a few days reading students' interpretations of Macbeth's character during Act 1 of the play, reading their recreative accounts of serving alongside Banquo on the battlefield against MacDonald and the Norwegians. Year 9 students sat their exam after watching Rupert's 2010 production of the play, which features Patrick Stewart as Macbeth, Kate Fleetwood as Lady Macbeth, and lots and lots of stage blood, although not quite so much as appeared in the Roman Polanski production that I can recall watching as a Year 10 student myself. Gould's decision to set Shakespeare's drama in a 20th century totalitarian dystopic society at war with itself and with its neighbours does an excellent job in translating Macbeth's single-minded agitation for the Scottish throne into the bloody reign of terror that Macduff bewailed at 4, scene 3, when he declares, O nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant bloody sceptred, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? It was useful, too, to hear the leading actors' thoughts on their preparations for performing their roles on the Chichester Festival Theatre recording. My students particularly appreciated Kate Fleetwood's observations on Lady Macbeth's character and her reading of one of Shakespeare's most memorable stage creations. I was recently involved in an interesting Twitter conversation with a colleague about what the national curriculum might regard as the appropriate study of a Shakespeare play at Key Stage 3. In my view, 
the ideal remains a sequence that involves students reading through the complete play text at pace together before watching the stage production and only then attempting to make sense of the play's language, themes and cultural significance. The challenge in the summer term is always about trying to create sufficient time for this to happen around end of year exams, delivering feedback on those exams and facilitating valuable educational trips while the weather is at its most amenable. Yesterday evening, I was back at work for a few hours supervising the end of year party for year 10, complete with fizzy drink, chicken and chips, ice cream, garden games and a Glastonbury Festival playlist that sounded suspiciously reminiscent of the school discos of the 1980s. Apparently, just as I was taking orders for Fanta, Dr Pepper and Iron Brew, Rick Astley was busy covering Smith's tracks down on Worthy Farm. Meanwhile, on the distant edge of Europe, of course, the most extraordinary game of armed political chicken was being played out on the main highway between Rostov-on-Don and Moscow. Coverage of the Russian coup that wasn't a coup briefly elbowed pretty much everything else off of the airwaves for a while, as commentator after commentator popped up to offer more and more outlandish explanations for the events of the preceding 12 hours. I clearly wasn't the only one pondering just how quickly Burnham Wood was making its way to the outskirts of Dunsinane. In tonight's show, we are going to be looking at creativity through the prism of a neurological difference said to be experienced by about 10% of the British population and about 15 to 20% of the US population. It is a neurological difference considered to have played a significant part in the careers of the artists Leonardo da Vinci, Pablo Picasso, Jackson Pollock, Andy Warhol, and Robert Rauschenberg, in the careers of the musicians Lennon, Cher, Toyox, and Ozzy Osbourne, and in the careers of the writers F. Scott Fitzgerald, Agatha Christie, Gustave Flaubert, Jules Verne, and W.B. Yeats. I am talking, as I'm sure you will have guessed by now, about dyslexia. Reflecting on his struggles with reading as a school in the late 19th century, W.B. Yeats wrote, Several of my uncles and aunts had tried to teach me to read, and because I could not, and because I was better than children who read easily, had come to think, as I have learnt since, that I had not all my faculties. William's aunts and uncles, of course, could never have known at the time that this struggling pupil would go on to become one of the giants of Anglophone literature in the decades afterwards, credited with establishing a vibrant Irish poetic, theatrical and critical heritage in the early 20th century. One wonders how the young William held on to his enthusiasm for letters during his trials at the Godolphin School, pithily summed up in one school report that read that his general progress had been, quote, only there perhaps better in Latin than any other subject, very poor in spelling, end quote. Maybe what had enabled the student William to nourish the imaginative power for which his adult work is so notable was the artistic household within which he was raised. William's father, John Yeats, had given up studying law to study art in London. William's sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, became leading figures in the arts and crafts movement. William's brother, Jack, was an accomplished illustrator and painter, described by the critic John Berger as a great painter with a sense of the future, an awareness of the possibility of a world other than the one we know. And William's mother, Susan, had introduced her children to worlds that never were through her fondness for sharing Irish folktales, during a period in which the Yates children were educated at home, following their relocation to London from Sligo. Was an hereditary artistic intelligence the flame that enabled Yates the dreamer to become Yates the renowned playwright poet? Should we be regarding the Yates of as the product of a specialisation in imaginative exploration, to paraphrase Helen Taylor, and Martin David Vestergaard's study into developmental dyslexia, published in Frontiers of Psychology in 2022. 
And if so, how might major artistic achievements of Yeats and others be squared with a term traditionally regarded as defining a neurobiological disorder? Joining me on the show tonight from Indianapolis in the US to discuss personal experiences of dyslexia in the classroom and the visibility of neurodiversity in children's fiction is Abigail Griebelbauer. Abigail is a former teacher turned children's author and publisher. Her first series of picture books focuses on neurodiversity, with dyslexia, ADHD being the focal point of her first two published titles. When Abigail is not busy writing or substitute teaching, she enjoys going on author visits to schools and sharing her dyslexic experiences with today's young readers. Welcome to the show, Abigail, and thank you for joining us on Teachers Talk Radio. Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Our second guest, Michael Magrutcher, is an Austrian Californian multidisciplinary artist based in Los Angeles, whose current focus is activity, awareness as an educator, speaker, and author. Michael works on raising the awareness of our limitless human potential and maintains that his own dyslexia and dysgraphia have forced him to develop an awareness of seeing the world purely from a human perspective in order to survive. For Michael, art offers a powerful means of enhancing our awareness and understanding of the nuances of human-centric versus system-relevant living. Michael is also an advocate for understanding neurodiversity. It's great to have you with us tonight, Michael. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Uh, I, I, this is the first time that I use this. We can hear loud and clear. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Great to have Thank you, you with us. Thank you, guys. I, want, I wonder if we might begin with your educational journey, Abigail. Would you be happy to tell us a little bit about your experience of dyslexia initially as a school student? How did you first become aware that some of the challenges you faced in your schooling might be attributable to dyslexia? Yeah. Absolutely. So I actually was very fortunate because I was diagnosed with dyslexia in second grade, which is yearly in the UK. Um, and so I feel that that was pretty early. My teachers definitely saw a difference between where I was um, academically versus my peers, and then also what I was capable of in other subjects as well, um, versus reading and things like that. Some of the challenges that dyslexia really like were shown through uh, was reading aloud. Reading anything in the classroom was very, very difficult for me and something that I avoided at all cost. And then also basic math skills were difficult to learn as well. And then testing uh, brought on a lot of anxiety and luckily an accommodation I had for that in the future was being pulled out of the classroom actually and, and tested in a small group environment, or even just by myself in a room as well. So, so I think most of our listeners might be quite familiar with the challenge that dyslexic students face when it comes to text-based subjects, but what unique issues are there in maths, Abigail? In math specifically, I would say learning math facts of multiplication and things like that can be a very, very challenging thing. And then also telling time on a clock can be very challenging. And there's also another neurodiversity called dyscalculia or dyscalculic um, individuals. And that is more specific math learning disability. So I've not been diagnosed with that, but my dyslexia still brought on some challenges in math. Thank you. And as you move through your schooling then, Abigail, what kind of strategy did you seek to employ yourself or you advise to employ to help your studies? So the one that I already talked about was testing outside of the room. That was significantly helpful, but I'd have to say the one that I talk about when I go to speak with students is advocating for yourself and asking for help. Um, I do believe it is a learned skill. It takes time. It takes practice to be able to understand how to ask for help and when to ask for help. So I think the more you can do it in school, the better off you are later in life when you still need to use that skill. Thanks. And we heard in that WB Yates quotation, didn't we, this sense that 
perhaps there's a case that needs to be made in the classroom environment to encourage students that their struggles with dyslexia aren't linked in any way to intelligence. Absolutely. I think that's something that is not only important for a child with dyslexia to know, but also even classmates and other people inside the classroom as well. I think sometimes that can be misunderstood as a student not being smart enough and that's why they are getting tested differently or that's why they're getting pulled out of the classroom or additional help. And that's really just not the case. So you found some aspects of your reading a bit of a struggle. What was it that kept you going, Abigail? Probably my parents. Um, there is just an expectation of even though it's challenging, it still has to get done. And so it was not easy, but I would say a lot of my success I can contribute to my parents sitting down at the din dining room table and really were everything and it may have been a struggle and it may have been loud at points but it definitely made a difference in the end um but our homework at home for me would have been significantly longer than my and how did you manage that around everything else that teenagers want to do when they're young Absolutely. So that's what it was more in elementary school. Then when we get to high school, I would say that I had a drive to want to be involved in the arts. And so I was in band, I was in theater, whether it was on stage or in the backstage. Um, I did a lot of stuff with even like a show choir and stuff. And so my schedule was very, very busy. I danced on top of all of that as well. And so I knew how long the work would take for myself. And so I just kind of accounted for that. So if we had a break, maybe I was working on my homework, whereas some of my friends were just sitting and chatting. I would know that I needed to study for my vocab test on Friday, or if I needed to work on a project earlier than most, um, I just kind of account for that in high school. Um, and then in high school, I also had a specific class um, during the day that was allowed me the time to work on stuff and ask questions. And that's really where it was important for me to advocate for myself, because the more I got done during that time, the less I would have to do with my busy schedule after. Yeah, it's interesting because it sounds to me like you benefited from a considerable range of activities outside the classroom that must have meant for you, I suspect, that school meant something more than just book learning. Yes, for sure. I think the ability to be in class along with working with my classmates outside of school, whether it's through theatre or it was dance or whatever it may be, we also worked on those things while at school too. And so it was kind of nice to be able to go back and forth and having people around you who understood um, not only what you're working on in school, but also the things that you're working on. Um, after. And when you finished high school then, Abigail, you moved into teaching eventually. Could you explain to us how that happened, please? Yes. So when I left high school, I went to the University of Evansville with the idea that I would major in element or uh, in international studies and global business because I really love to travel and that just sounded like it was going to be a fit. Um, but it wasn't until I had done another summer, uh, being a camp counselor that I realized that I really want to continue to work with uh, the youth and educate as well. And so that's when I changed my degree to elementary education specifically special education. Um, and so I changed that right before I had left to um, study abroad. And what was it particularly that appealed to you, to you about going back into the classroom, Abigail? I think it had to do a little bit with the hardships that I face in the classroom and understanding and knowing that I'm not alone in that and that there's many other kids who need the help that I had or that I did for myself and kind of wanting to make sure that this next group of kids either uh, don't have to go through some of those things of like reading aloud and, and stuff and I understand it from a different perspective. And so I think having a teacher who can understand your struggles is something that is very unique and it's not something that I experienced going through school. Um, so I think that that was something 
of spread. So you brought to your new career in teaching then a wealth of empathy, perhaps, which is a really, really crucial attribute to possess, I think, for primary teaching or elementary teaching. How did your colleagues react to working with a teacher who was working through issues of dyslexia? Well, first, I'd love to say that empathy, yes, absolutely. That was huge going into the classroom. But as far as my coworkers and my colleagues at school, I would say it kind of was a little bit of a shock to them that they had never really worked with somebody with dyslexia before, as far as I know. And I think the accommodations that I did for myself myself were kind of like unique to them. They didn't understand that I still use these accommodations well beyond being at school myself. And I was very fortunate that the uh, other teacher across the way taught first grade. I taught fifth grade and I would help her with technology stuff in her classroom. And she would actually read my newsletters and emails before I would send them off to parents sometimes. And so I think it was just that back and forth of, you know, me wanting to help her helping me was just something that was super and are you able to tell us a little bit more about how you coped with the training process? Because I certainly know that in the UK, the training process for early career teachers is quite arduous, very heavy on the paperwork and often eats up most of your weekends. Yes, I actually was still a part of dance when I was at university. And so I was dance team looked very different in at university with uh, basketball games and things like that for dancing. It was not a competitive team by any means, but I think that it was, again, I knew that I had a specific amount of time to accomplish things, get stuff done. And one of the things that I think I wish I knew back then was that there's actually an accommodation that I didn't know existed, or I didn't know that you could do that, um, is actually staggering deadlines within all of your classes and I don't know you know what types of colleges or universities would accept that but it's basically getting all of your deadlines from all of your classes that you are taking and then moving some of those deadlines around so you don't have the same deadline specifically for like one class there was one day where I had I think three different projects due and I was like actually embarrassed with one of the ones that I had to turn in because I just did not have enough time to get them all done within the same amount of time frame. So I think that that was one accommodation that I wish I could have asked for if I knew that had existed. Yeah, I have a feeling that kind of accommodation is fairly typical now in English schools. It's something that we certainly work on with our students. Um, requiring them to get six pieces of work in all on the same day is sometimes a bit of a mission for anyone. But particularly if it's going to take you an extra 25% in terms of available minutes in the day to get that work in. So that sounds like something that might be going in the right direction. So it sounds like you brought some of the positive elements of your own early diagnosis and development from your own school days into your own classroom. What did you particularly enjoy working with in terms of texts and in terms of topics with your students? I think it was high school where I really enjoyed math. I think math is um, something that once you get past the basic math facts and things um, that I found challenging, it's a very, everything has the right answer. Where with English and writing, sometimes you would probably think that might be my favorite as now I'm an author, but I think the simplicity, simplicity of knowing that there is a right answer and a wrong answer and that there are many ways to get to that answer still, but that there is, you can check. And I think that's something that I did love about in teaching in the classroom. And then I would also say, I really tried to help my students understand and know that they have their own creative. And so the way that they want to turn in a project or the way that they want to work on something is fine. And that, you know, whatever works well for them is something that like I will try to adjust to. And I think that that was something that was different or unique and helpful. 
And how did you manage the challenge of reading text to a class? Because that's largely quite a bit of what elementary school teachers do, isn't it? Yes, we definitely did a novel studies. So sometimes I would have novel studies be in small groups. And so individual groups would be reading a certain book. So not everyone would be reading the same one. And then if we were reading the same one, I would actually have it on Audible and I would have the classroom listen to the book instead of me reading it because the amount of energy that it would take for me to read it um, was not going to be able to fit within our day. And so being able to have those audiobooks were a significant um, accommodation that I used. Fantastic. So drawing on all of the capabilities of technology, I think, to get students involved in what's happening and perhaps to lighten the kind of cognitive load on yourself as you're operating the classroom, because there's so much going on in a classroom um, when there are people in it beyond ourselves. How much of this thinking did you carry over into your career as a children's author? And what was it that caused you to move into that particular uh, realm, Abigail? So I would say that I never really aspired to be an author. That's not something that I ever thought that I would become. But back in 2019, after just two years of teaching, I had decided that I had loved my study abroad experience in the UK so much that I wanted to go back and, and live there because I was young and I was like, this is the time to now do it. And so in 2020, 2019, 2020 school year, I was actually substitute teaching. And so when COVID hit and I didn't have to substitute teach because no one was in person learning anymore, I had to think of a different way to kind of use the time that I had. And I had remembered my experience not only as a child with dyslexia, but also even as a teacher wanting to kind of have that conversation with students, but not knowing really where to start. And I know that children's books are a perfect way to have a conversation or to start a conversation. And so that's kind of what sparked the idea behind the first book is for Darcy, not dyslexia, which is really in part kind of my own school experience growing up with dyslexia. And how do the children in schools respond to texts when you visit them to read to them? Yes, that's absolutely my favorite part about being an author is the author visits is going into the schools and talking with the students. It will range um, because some students have a little bit more knowledge about dyslexia, even in second grade or even younger. A lot of my talks are fourth grade, um, kindergarten to second. I've talked to some seventh graders as well. But I think one of the things that is kind of like the most common would be just asking questions of, can I, can, can I get dyslexia? Like, is it contagious or something like that? You know, questions that they have, they're curious about it, but they just don't know. And so I love being able to answer those questions and say that, you know, it's lifelong, but it's something that you can just catch from somebody else. It runs in families but it's not going to be something that you're um, going to get throughout life. It's either you're born with it or you're not. And so I think that's something to have those conversations start so young. It allows the other students who maybe aren't dyslexic or maybe who are and just don't know it yet to kind of see a different perspective, different from their own. And do you meet many aspiring dyslexic authors? I do meet a lot of other dyslexic individuals. The kids love to come up to me afterwards and say, I have dyslexia too. And so that's always super fun for them being willing to share that with me because when I was that young, I mean, no one was having conversations, but it's not something that I just broadcasted when I was young. Um, but I think that it definitely was something that was super important to have those things. And yes, there are some students that even at the school that I now still substitute teach at, they are aspiring authors and so it's really fun to have them give me their copy of the book that they have written and kind of to read through it and stuff and do you have to give any careful thought to the kinds of language you print in your texts if you're going to be using them to represent dyslexia in elementary school settings yes i think that this is always like, I think the most challenging part about writing a children's book is that you only have a specific amount of pages to fit in your story. 
and it, it for a kid's book, it needs to be a story. It needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So I wanted to make sure that I created a story where someone with dyslexia can really understand, like, that is me. That is who I am, all that kind of stuff. But there are some people now who are saying, oh, you should have put this in or you should have put that in. And I understand where they're coming from and why it's important, but that's not for this book. And maybe that's for a different book, but that's why it's so important to have so many different uh, books that have to do with dyslexia or have to do with neurodiversity because they're all going to take little bits of it um, that they can fit within those pages. And do you think we're seeing more neurodiverse characters in children's fiction generally? I do, but I think it's one of those things where now I'm in that area that I see it so often. I think it's still a struggle to kind of find on the bookshelf, unfortunately. I think it's something that you do have to seek out, but I believe that we are getting closer to it being on the bookshelf and being able to be seen in like Barnes and Nobles and Target and, and, um, libraries and And do you think bookshops could be doing anything more to make books more appealing to dyslexic readers well we use a specific font called open dyslexic and some people with dyslexia have found it helpful and so that's something that we do as publishing the books but i would say for books i would maybe even have like a different section or a table that kind of includes easier reads that maybe look or feel like where they want to be, whether it's an adult or whether it's a child, but having them have a lower level of reading, something that they can do easier, or even saying like, here's these audiobooks. These are the ones that have great audiobooks. So you can kind of get a book and listen to the audiobook, which is kind of my favorite way of digesting a book is being able to listen to it while I can see the I have to say I'm not dyslexic myself Abigail but that's much my preferred way of reading to particularly long novels where I have to get into the voices and the characters heads uh, I find it very very effective it's something we use in our in class too when we're teaching our students their exam texts and it seems to work for most of the dyslexic students I've taught actually Yes, absolutely. That's amazing. And that's one of the reasons why when I thought about the first audiobook that I ended up recording it myself with my voice, because there's a part in the book where she struggles to read. And I knew that if I hired a professional voice actor, that they would very much struggle (laughs) with how to actually struggle to read. And so that's kind of why I did it myself. But, you know, if you listen to the audiobook, it's it's me reading it, which I think is kind of good as the author for that. Thank you for your thoughts, Abigail, on that. That set the scene very nicely for our discussion this evening, I think. After the news, we'll hear from Michael, who will give us a sense of his own experiences as a dyslexic learner and his view of dyslexia as a creative superpower. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go, well-being and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio news the university
Universities and Colleges Employers Association, UCEA, is playing down the impact a marking boycott is having on students. This is the view of the University and College Union, according to a report on the BBC. The UCEA represents 144 institutions and has released a survey which suggests most student graduations are not being affected by the boycott. This is contrary to the UCU view that this survey accounts for fewer than half of universities. Some students have graduated without their final marks, whilst others have seen graduations delayed. The boycott is part of a long-running dispute over paying conditions, which has been previously reported on Teachers Talk Radio News. Many students have complained about the lack of communication around the impact of the boycott from their universities, whilst others highlight the fact that it is coming at the end of an already fragmented experience of university brought about by the impact of the pandemic. Whilst the UCEA survey suggests that the impact on students is different in each university, its chief was keen to say it showed that the majority of students were not facing a graduation without their final marks, although Raj Jethwa was quick to point out that this would be little comfort to those who were affected. The industrial action in the higher education sector is just part of a wider action taken by those in education. But Sky News and other outlets reported that PM Rishi Sunak could be considering a block on recommendations by peer review bodies from across the public sector. The teaching peer review body presented its recommendations to ministers and it is expected to be published next month. Leaked reports suggest it could be a proposal of 6.5%. Government sources deny the claims made originally in the Times, but stated that pumping money into the economy risk fueling inflation. In an editorial in The Guardian, recruitment and retention problems were highlighted again, with some alarming figures suggesting that one in four new teachers leave the profession within three years. The piece goes on to cite the huge range of issues that schools deal with, including sexual harassment and bullying, as well as home circumstances and their effects. This view was further emphasised this week with a report from The Observer focusing on the stresses being placed on pupil referral units. The units cater for children who have been excluded from mainstream schools. But leaders are now saying they are full to bursting because of unprecedented levels of behaviour incidents in schools. Data suggests that permanent exclusions are rising after a brief lull on the return to school after the pandemic. The former Children's Commissioner Anne Longfield says in the report that schools are buckling under the pressure of children with complex needs and cites cuts to public services leaving a lack of support in its wake. She called the situation a disaster for vulnerable children. A former head teacher of a Pru instruction on Tees said she had dealt with children spitting, kicking and swearing. Her school had previously tried to take children on short outreach programmes, but now this was impossible due to overload. Finally, the BBC features calls by EastEnders actress Rose Ailing Ellis for sign language lessons to be made freely available to those who need them, including parents and carers of deaf children. The British Sign Language user says she cannot believe that some parents and guardians of deaf children have to pay for tuition. The cost of an accredited course can be anywhere between 200 and 700 pounds. Martin McLean, Senior Policy Advisor at the National Deaf Children's Society, says funding is inconsistent and a postcode lottery, with some local authorities funding it whilst others don't. Spokesmen for leaders across all four home nations have made statements in support of improving access to BSL, but only the Welsh Government says it is already included in the curriculum for schools. In 2022, the British Sign Language Bill was passed, recognising BSL as an official language and the Department for Education in England says it is working towards a BSL GCSE which should be available from September 2025. A spokesperson for the Scottish Government has said that its teaching council is working with the University of Edinburgh on the development of an undergraduate degree in primary education and BSL. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to discuss tech that will help you battle one of the worst things that can possibly happen in school, the 
Nothing is worse than melting all day while trying to deliver lessons. Yet, we all have to suffer it. Let's see what tech has to offer you. Through searching the web, I found a few cool gadgets. Pun totally intended. Starting with the cheapest, a neck fan. It looks like an 80s pair of headphones around your neck. Rechargeable with different speed settings. It's got some decent reviews and at £14, may be worth a try. Although high settings have more noise, so it might not be great for quiet times. For £20, you can get a personal air cooler. This has a tank of water, so not only fan but uses the water to super cool the air. Nice. £29 gets you a waste fan. Clip it onto your belt or use the belt supplied and it blows up your shirt. Again, rechargeable and you can choose a front or back position. As with the previous though, noise may be a problem. Next, staying with the fan idea, for £70 you can get a cooling vest. This is a vest filled with fans, not unlike those you see on novelty inflatable fancy dress suits. The fans pass cool air over you and you stay cool. Then, noise is a factor here though. If you're willing to splash out for a hundred pounds, how about a cooling vest with elements instead? Basically, it looks like an FBI bulletproof vest you see on TV with reusable ice packs. It's obviously very quiet, however, will make squeezing through tight spaces a little more difficult. Also, preparation is needed as the packs will need to be frozen overnight. In conclusion, fans are the cheapest way to go and you look like you're standing in hero wind, but noise is a factor. Vests may keep you cool, but you certainly will not look it. I suppose you could always try sticking an ice pack in a plastic bag and putting it in your pocket. What do you do to stay cool? Let us know at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods. Your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome back. I'm discussing neurodiversity and creativity this evening with children's author Abigail Griebelbauer and multidisciplinary artist Michael McGrutcher. Abigail has given us a compelling account of her route into writing for children in order to raise awareness of dyslexia and neurodiversity in school settings and the challenges she has overcome on the way. Michael, you've pursued a similarly creative path in the visual arts and the guiding of visual artists. When did you first realise that the visual arts were your calling and what part did your dyslexia and dysgraphia play in this discovery? I was, I think I was, I was unconscious of it, actually. I was, um, it just happened. I couldn't fit, as I told you, I had to, uh, you know, I had to repeat grades. Uh, I actually, after three grades of repeating, I couldn't repeat grades anywhere. And then I had to go in the uh, work world. Because I didn't fit in, I had to be more human centric and I very much uh, relate to everything Abigail says. I can only confirm very similar things. For example, I, the only thing I, I passed was math. Uh, the, uh, uh, I failed English, I failed German, I failed a a everything else. Uh, I could not uh, talk in front of people. I could not read. I still can't read. I wrote six books and have uh, have them read to, to me by the computer. And I think it it when I was thirty, it kind of uh, I looked at my resume, and I thought, oh my god, you know everything I did, creativity. Uh, I sold tapes out of the trunk. I uh, produced fashion shows. I uh, was uh, advertising. All my jobs were creativity related. So I couldn't even say, oh, I could have been a, an accountant because I, school was basically a wall for me. And that was 40 years. And we have to say this was 40 years. So a lot of things that uh, helped Abigail that, that she was, uh, you know, that, that people gave her attention and stuff uh, is super helpful today. I mean, you know, we were, we were racist until uh, we had to see, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter or something, or Me Too. Uh, this is systemically to get us aware of things and 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 to get us aware of our human condition as neurodiverse people. Uh, that we are all, you know, it's it's possible for everybody to get it. I think it's twenty percent uh, of humans are neurodiverse. So I think it just, you know, to answer your question, I I wasn't conscious. I lived day by day. And I think the first consciousness that I was an artist or attracted to art was when I was 30. 
And in terms of educating yourself as an artist then, Michael, how did that work if your connection with art had been problematic at school? Yeah, it was, oh, I, I, I couldn't draw. I, I'm also dysgraphia. I have dysgraphia with dyslexia, so I can't read my own writing. I cannot copy, like, a, you know, draw a portrait of somebody, not even close. Uh, that's why I'm an abstract art. And because it's not about copying, it's, it just wants to be created and exposed. It doesn't say you have to have, you know, have to be Rothko or... <laughs> A wall, or you have to have uh, unbelievable success. It just uh, you just create art. Just you create it, and whatever happens, happens. And um, and that's also a you know uh, I think that's why neurodiverse people are looking for uh, arts because the most uh, percentage of neurodiverse uh, divergent people are in the arts because art doesn't require. Uh, you know, that a woman would play a man in a play or vice versa. Uh, it doesn't say, oh, we can only play, you know, this race or that race. Uh, you, sexuality, you know, art doesn't, doesn't care. It's about the, it's about what you perform. It's about the performance. It's, uh, and that's why I always say, you know, symphony orchestra, uh, if the light doesn't go, you can have the best conductor and the best first violinist, but if, if they, uh, the, uh, you know, the guy doesn't turn on the light, the, for, the, the curtain doesn't open, or the oboist uh, plays a wrong song, it all affects the piece. And people know this in the C level, on, on, on the linear level of, uh, uh, you know, businesses or companies, uh, you exchange like a cog on the wheel. If the bottom line, you don't, you know, the C level never knows what the bottom line does and if if they are not working or even managers don't work and you get exchange and that's i think that's what what uh art teaches us it gives us a blueprint of what's humanly possible because it's not about it's not about the form it's about the function and you've spoken before about this idea michael of dyslexia as a kind of superpower it seems that there's an increasing body of research evidence to suggest that those people who are neurodiverse have strengths beyond people who are neurotypical in different areas. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit about that as an idea for us? I, I personally believe from my experience, and I, I don't know what Abigail thinks, but I think she thinks the same thing because I've, I talked to a lot to neurodiverse people. I think it's a normality. I think, I think actually neurodiverse people are normal. And I think the the ones that are system relevant, that are very, you know, uh, Elon Musk or, or I think they are chess players. They are very good in the system. So if you say the system is monopoly, that's what playing financial principles, that is the game. Uh, that is, you have to adapt to that because you can't be a chess player without knowing chess and studying chess. Uh, and, and I think, uh, without education to be in that system, which education is, it gets you into the system of monopoly in some way or the other or, and selects you out to get you to the right position. I think the normal way how humans would be and interact uh, would be uh, like neurodiverse people. Uh, we have 40 people uh, in the Octopus Movement, which is a, a, a worldwide organization for uh, neurodiverse pe people. And they are on all kinds of uh, uh, weird things. And you bring them together. We, we, we knock out uh, white papers. And I think that's a normal thing. So we get the function of knocking out a, a white paper about JetGPT, for example, with complete chaos but it is, it gets it out. And you have so much creating this, it's amazing. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Actually, even for those people that don't regard themselves as uh, neurodivergent, the sense to which creativity can sometimes be an inherently messy process. Mm -hmm. It is, it is, it is, it, it, it is a, because what does art want? It wants you to create. It doesn't need, it doesn't want, it wants you to create and, and, uh, 
It doesn't say how to create it. It doesn't say what to create. It doesn't say how many many uh, rewards or m monetary rewards are good. You should just create. And while you're creating, you're actually getting into the into the the moment. You can't think about how oh, I have to run my dog uh, out or I have to uh, get some groceries. You in the creation process, you lose uh, time space. You don't know. So, it, and I know this from writing. I I write. And I keep writing, and then oh, oh my God, it's like nine o'clock at night. Uh, it's it, it's something that gets you this this flow, and the more you use that flow of being in in time space, um, in the moment, the the better you feel. Your whole body isn't stressed, and you can do you can do enormous work. And and I think why neurodiverse people are more. Uh, I'd like so having a superpower is because they're always all over scanning context and then pulling in to actually put down what, what they, what they learned from that context. And that's usually very to the point. And somebody, people say, you know, these people are not nice or whatever, but they're very honest and to the point. Um, I, I hope I, I answered your question. Yeah, I think so. And it's it's worth noting as well, of course, that those people who are creative will sit down and be looking to design something that hasn't been done before, whether in a minor way or a major way, because what would be the point in creating something that already exists? Exactly. Yeah. So how does your art practice then into coaching and guiding other artists, Michael, because the art world is potentially quite an intimidating thing to join if you don't know the right people. See, I, I kind of, by writing the book, uh, you know, the, the, I wrote five uh, art-related books, but the last book that I wrote, and by writing all the books, I got the context of creating. I, I'm probably one of five people in the world that really understands the creation process from a human centric level, not from a system centric. You can ask me about art history and I, I flunk horribly, but I can, I can literally look at a, a work or in work in progress and tell you what's missing and why it is what it is and why it does what it does. And I, I learned that by diving into, into what is art. You know, and I found out in the last book that it is not about, uh, it's not about the product. It's about the creation process because the creation process is basically a communication between your non-physical, that's not spiritual, it's just non-physical self, which you, when you sleep, that's when you're not non-physical, you're not conscious of the, on the, the physical plane and you interact and says, okay, I want to do a radio show. And then you say, okay, what should that radio show be? And then people tell you or whatever. And then all of a sudden you have that enlightenment. Oh, it should be a, a radio show about teaching. Uh, and, and then you go in and you develop and change and adapt in that conversation. And the radio show is nice and, uh, or the book that you wrote is nice. But the way to get to that book, to bring it into the physical, to physical manifestation of creation is what's priceless. You can't put a price on that. Uh, I know that if I wouldn't have done art, and I know pretty much I'm not talking for Abigail, but I think she, she, she might uh, agree with, to this. The, the creative process is so powerful because you literally have an idea and you manifest it. And in that manifestation, product might be horrible in society. Society doesn't see this as art, doesn't uh, appreciate it, or it says it's the absolute best thing they have ever seen. Neither the best or the worst classification of or categorization of what the art is, the art, your art product is, nobody can take away that you did it. And what that does is for yourself, and you know, when you're unconscious, you don't know, but when you become conscious, you say, oh my God, I had the idea and I made a book. I had the idea, I made this sculpture. I, had the, I wrote this song, I wrote this poem. And this nobody can take away. It doesn't, make, it doesn't worry about the form. 
it's the, it's the function of creating that form that is the value, not the form itself. That's the form because I cannot uh, I cannot paint you, uh, Christopher. Even if we were the best buddies, I couldn't paint you a p painting and say, "Oh, you're gonna love it." You don't. I I, I could paint it. You say, uh, I th and that my perception is perhaps I th was thinking wrong that you like it. And that's why you shouldn't create for other people. You should create for yourself the best that you can do. That's interesting, Michael. Let's get Abigail's view on that. Abigail, has what Michael said about the creative process struck a chord with you? Yes, I think creativity is such an individualized like thing that can be very specific to you. For me, writing, like... I have the same thing of where if someone is like, oh, can you write this scene or can you write this story? My answer is probably no, because my best creativity comes from my own brain and what, what I'm thinking and through learning how to write and all of that kind of stuff. But my best ideas are through myself. And if I have to write based on what somebody else is asking me to, it's probably not going to turn. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. I, I totally agree. So how does the world of commissions work for you then, Michael, in that case? <laughs> Not good. Like I, do. I, I work in hospitality. That's what all the artists do. We work in hospitality and, and, uh, and do odd jobs so we can actually do our job as being an artist, you know, because, and this is one of my work, my work is to light on the creation process to that we as human, not society or not special system, religion or politics, that we as humans uh, come to appreciate, milk every moment of creation and by doing this become very much self-aware. Uh, we, we know what our unique, one of a kind of 8 billion people's energy is manifested in the physical. And... And then once we do that, then we can actually uh, find ourselves in, you know, implementing into systems. Uh, so meaning, so my long way of 50 years uh, hitting the wall, you know, that I have to fit in, I have to fit in because the DNA drive of your, yourself tells you, you got to fit in, you got to fit in. Uh, actually, I found myself because I'm now, nothing has changed financially or, 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 or career-wise, but I found myself to be fulfilled, to wake up in the morning and be happy, you know, having problems and, and, and handle them, but at night and go to bed happy. And I think to find art helps you a lot. I mean, I wouldn't know who I am. I would probably be dead a lot of times uh, if I didn't have art that kept me that enough self-aware and finding out more of myself and make me confident uh, to do what I do. And now, obviously, since I really got that separated because it, I, it, it hurt me so much that here's art that saved me and 97 to 99% worldwide artists are existing around the poverty level. And I said, how can that be when it's so praised as all that? All that and, it, and it really is treated by economy like it's it's nothing and humans don't understand the creation process and so this is my big mission to to make people aware of the creation process that we could save ourselves a lot of psychiatrists and and education and everything we could just tweak everything better to to work human centric and then have systems work for us not we submitting to systems like you poor teachers do that you have to fill out all this system relevant stuff. Yep, it's certainly a systems industry education at the moment. I wonder, Michael, if you could tell us how you work with particular artistic students to guide them towards this way of thinking about the artistic creation process. Explain that to me, that question. I didn't understand it. Yeah, how, how do you work with young artists to take them to this position where they're recognizing that self-awareness is what they need to make art rather than academic drawing and copying and that kind of practice. Yeah. I don't 
distinguish the, the, the academic uh, academia, not at all. <clears throat> but I think before you can actually get into a, a, academia, you need to know, know who you are. I think, I think, I know so many of my friends that go to university and they, and they expect that university is teaching you what you're supposed to do. And then people go on logic and, and, and a linear thought and said, okay, being, you know, a long time, you know, uh, is this now, but not anymore, I think, but, you know, become in my age, it was all become a lawyer because then you can work anywhere or, or go into get a, a business degree because you can work everywhere. And so these generalized ideas are really not helping a person that is young, that wants to develop, find who they are, because they are one of one. Everybody is, we forget, we say, oh, there's 8 billion people and we have to teach them versus there's 8 billion individual people with their own DNA, their own fingerprints, their own eyes that that need to be taught who they are to then implement the last thing is to implement them in systems. So the finding of self and therefore art is extremely powerful in this, much more powerful than any education to find yourself. And then once you find yourself to get in. So if I work with, with kids, I say, you know, do what you feel. If what do you feel? And, and, and then they say, I want to draw. I want to, you know, play the, 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 the piano. I want to do this and let them try. And I always, you know, uh, preach to never buy your kids an instrument till the kid has decided to play this instrument. Not that you say, oh, it would be great if you could play piano, but try it out because I was forced or not forced. I, I wanted to play a guitar player. I had two years of classical guitar and I can do four chords because of my dyslexia. I was my, my definition, when I was uh, diagnosed with dyslexia, they just said, you have dyslexia, but you have to do everything else. And so then I found out and I gave up on, on playing an instrument. And then I found out in a party where somebody said, oh, our percussionist got sick. Can you just put a color in the music? And I was virtuoso. I, 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 I totally exploded. I, I made a CD, uh, you know, and I'm still you know, uh, liking to play with, with guys, but it's, that's a percussion. That's, that's not guitar. So it's about finding yourself in that example. I say, when I work with kids or students, I say, what is that? What, what makes you not suffer when, what makes you not push through what makes you, what, what comes easy? Uh, it's, you know, if, if you want to play the guitar, why would you want to play the guitar if, the the product the final product doesn't work uh, so so do what, what 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 makes you sound makes you reflect the art the best where you get yourself the best results not what other people say but where you feel like i'm the best when i do ballet it doesn't matter what other people say it's it it, it you need to discover you there's a reason why you like ballet and, and, and even if it's a wrong reason, for me, it was a wrong reason to play guitar because I wanted to play like Jimi Hendrix. And that was a wrong, that was, I copy, we copy each other. And that I learned, I learned from that, you know, from, 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 from doing that. So for me, it's all experimentation and play to find what resonates. And once it resonates, then go and then we can look and say, hey, now let's get a formal education into, you know, guitar playing or, Whatever you, wherever you found that, that you like, because then you have to also the, the passion to finish it, to go through. We don't, people don't have passion when they figure out, oh, that's not really, I wanted, not really wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know that was it. And then, and then, and then they push themselves through to be a lawyer. Defeats so the purpose. Want, go ahead. So I wonder, Michael, when you've finished your work, do you display in galleries? And if you do, how do you respond to that? whole kind of public presentation of the finished work that you're happy with you know i was i was i had magazine covers i uh, i had exhibition at the airport i had i was with you know very uh uh recognized galleries here in 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 southern california uh i don't know what you want to i show them my art and if somebody wants to buy it i sell it to him 
I, I you know, or her. It's, it's, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not very in product. I'm, I, I, I don't get a lot odd if people like my art or not. Now, then I want it to be, and it didn't happen. But the moment I actually created, uh, I have more people that, that like my art. But it is really my art in, in, in the art business wouldn't be my, my paintings. I'm, I'm not a famous painter. I'm not a famous musician. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I did 200 interviews within a year because I want to talk about this. But uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not famous for my work. And but the sense of the process, I think, is is really important it's about passing the tradition on, isn't it? So these these artists that you're working with that are developing yeah. around the sense of the self aware art movement, that's yeah. surely as important in passing the process on. Absolutely. I mean that this is what I you know I, I call myself a, a creativity awareness educator, and because that that I had to really find this word because that I could I couldn't. Re uh, resonate with anything that was out there. And uh, yeah, the self-aware artist movement that I started in 2015 in uh, Laguna Beach uh, is about uh, knowing why you create what you're creating, uh, understanding what you're creating, and then be able to verbalize it and allow other people to follow the process. So they can relate to how you did that. You know, say for example, you stand in front of a, of a white canvas and said, what comes to me? Oh, yellow. And then you paint yellow. And then you say, oh, what, what else? What else fits that? Ah, green. Boom. You make a green. And then you keep on adding, adding, adding. And then at the end, there's, there's, a, there's a pivotal moment when the artwork takes over, like when your students take over and, and become selves. And then the, you can't just say, just learn that or just do that. They won't. And it's, that's how, how creation works. It's, you can't put a red dot on a certain place in that painting or a sound in that song or a, a word in that poem that doesn't think. Then, then it got its own life. And that's, that's what life is about, you know, finding your own life and being able to yeah, educate that. How did I find my life? And then you can uh, 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 relate. Uh, when Abigail uh, uh, talked, I, I felt like all um, a, a relief because I could relate to all the stuff that she went through. Yeah, and once that product is finished or once you've passed on that tradition or idea, I think, yeah. to the person who's looking to find their own sense of expression, that's the time to step back, really. Yeah. And I think take some pride in what it is you've achieved. Yeah, and allow it. Allow it to show you more. Yeah, I think that's definitely part of the, the creative process that I see in front of me mm -hmm. in my English classroom and my poetry workshops that I'm involved with mm -hmm. with my students. Abigail, is there a sense of satisfaction that comes to you from that witnessing others producing work in a similar way or a different way from the work you've been involved with? I think anybody who is willing to be open and share their experience, uh, specifically dyslexia for me, because that's what I can relate to as well, but really any experience in the neurodiversity area, because I think exactly what Michael said with you know, he felt relief from hearing what I had to say. I think that that's why it's so important to have conversations like these, because most of the time you don't really have too many people who are close to you who can relate to that. I feel very fortunate that I have a best friend who really can, but I don't, there's a lot of us who don't have many people who can relate. So once we hear it from other people, especially those who are adding to the representation through art or through books or through music or whatever that looks like for them. I mean, even athletes or something as well. I think that that is just um, shows that it's important. Well, thank you both for setting out so clearly your perspective on artistic creativity and the development of an alternative approach 
in Michael's case to traditional forms of art instruction. In the closing section of tonight's show, we will think about some of the ways in which neurodiverse creatives might be given more opportunities to flourish in the education system and in society more generally. So we'll be right back after this. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This program has been brought to you by... Welcome back to the final part of tonight's show on neurodiversity and creativity. Abigail Griebelbauer and Michael Magritte have outlined their own experiences as dyslexic creatives, some of the ways in which dyslexic students might unlock their creative superpowers and find effective strategies for managing some of the challenges associated with dyslexia to live happy and successful lives in the creative world. In the final section of tonight's show, perhaps we could consider how education might adapt to support the creative output of the neurodiverse. Abigail, what are your thoughts on this? Yes, I think that creativity is important, but I think we also need to teach that perfectionism isn't and that nothing needs to be perfect. Everyone's perfect is different in their own eyes. And I think that's something that I feel like right now with the social media and internet and just what kids have access to so early now, I feel like that want to be perfect is a lot sooner than what it was even for me. And so I think a focus on that is something that's going to be helpful for not only neurodiverse individuals, but really every. Michael, do you have a view on that? I've I've just put this in the room. What what is education? And uh, education is nothing else other than bringing humans into systems so they can support system and support themselves. And they have a certain kind of security. Now, it doesn't teach you how to be a human, how to be interacting with human, other than when you're socially you know, hanging out in school. And that's why it's important. I think the most, the biggest value that school gives you with, you know, yes, there's bullying, all kinds of stuff, but this is the world. And the, the strongest thing I think is uh, in education is the social interaction. Because if you can socially interact, then you will be, uh, you will, you will get a, a place in a system, even if it's nepotism or whatever. But you will learn about yourself. As thing, it's it's all about learning about yourself. We are there's nobody is normal. Nobody fits in systems. There are eight billion individuals. So finding yourself, being the best of yourself. If education could give that, becoming the best of yourself, and then you will find automatically what is good, how to fit into the systems. That's that's my theory on that. Thank you. Abigail, how do we encourage students to develop this sense of themselves so that they can negotiate the systems that they're going to enter or remodel those systems because there's no reason that the future should look like the past, is there? I think that it really starts with teacher education and and not just like those who are in the program to be teachers, but really teachers in general. Um, I can only speak for the perspective I have had, which is basically the state of Indiana and the U.S. for teachers, unless, you know, you include the teachers that I've had the wonderful opportunity to do school visits and things like that. But I think the understanding of neurodiversity is something that 
is not really spent too much time on and needs to be spent understanding what that looks like, how it can present itself. Strengths are something that's extremely important for teachers to understand to help even, you know, find, help, help the students find their own strengths. And then also understanding like what the accommodations they may need and then what to look for before even getting testing. Um, testing is definitely something that getting that diagnosis can be life-changing in the best possible. So it sounds like you're saying there might be more work to be done on the practice side of teaching <laughs> rather than the subject knowledge side of the subject you're delivering, Abigail. Yes, I think that it's obviously important to know the subject and know how to teach the subject. But I think a lot of the times we're not teaching the difference that the children are going to be experiencing, like the colleagues that I had who were, you know, very shocked by the accommodations that I still used later on in life. I think that that's something that could be more understood, um, that it is something that is, you know, lifelong. And you as a teacher, I think it's such a unique opportunity. I loved my experience teaching for a couple of years because as kids, you know, your world is so large. You don't, you don't know what you don't know. And so I think having kids understand a little bit more about themselves and, and helping them find that, I think that's a Michael, from the artistic perspective, is there any particular thing you would like to see introduced into schools to help students yep. with that self-expression side of becoming artists? See, I'm I'm totally also that you understand systems, but now it's it's a time when when to induce that. Uh, so for me. Uh, you know, I'm working a couple of models, uh, uh, new models that are separated by uh, team sports because you're going to work in a team in a system. Uh, team sports, team art creation, uh, tending for a non-verbal communication, a pet, tending to a pet, uh, because you need to learn. We don't have just language, which is a system too. It's limited. You have to learn to communicate with an animal in some way or form that you know it's not just all in the brain and have an awareness session of the experience that because we know experiential learning is awareness, which leads to wisdom. And then when, once you have that, let's say the, the primary school, and then you go into university because you know where you're going to go. And, and then go to university and perhaps have a, you know, a lead in or something, but the more you know what you are and you have passion for that, the learning process will be much shorter. You'd say, oh my God, we, we didn't teach you all that stuff. No, but you, you, you taught us to be human. And I think if, if we can do that, uh, just from the experience, uh, and then the awareness and everything together, uh, and there is, like I say, humans help each other we are unique there's a reason why we are unique to help each other so i don't want to go and say okay we now need to say dyslexic like like uh, life's matter i i, I don't want to say that all life matters every human uh we have to remind ourselves that we were separated in genders uh in races and sexuality by systems so uh, primarily we are all humans and that's what art always represents so I think that's a good, good, good start if we can start with that. Yeah. And do you feel, because I certainly get the impression sometimes in the UK that I feel this, that the arts are being squeezed out of cultural life in an Absolutely. attempt to rush towards science, engineering, technology and capital? Yeah. But the NFT is the, the proof what you just said. NFT is using the arts to selling crypto. You, you use the, the art project, the spirit of artists, you know, being crazy, being free, being all this, this, even though they are not, they're, they're like I said, 97 to 99 percent uh, uh, on the exist on the poverty level. But the, we, you know, the, the systemically, because they're, they're run by financial principles, uh, 
you know, look at the product, not at nobody cares unless you're Warhol, nobody cares about the artist. Everybody is about the, uh, the product, the music, the, you know, and if that resonates with people, because if the music that you make doesn't resonate with people, then, you know, you are on your own. Yeah. How do you feel about the role that the arts play in cultural education generally, Abigail, where you are? Yes, they are definitely being pushed out. And I think it's so sad. Um, we've had at one school that I have been have been teaching at regularly, the music teacher unfortunately had to leave early at the beginning of the year. And so I was like, okay, I can step in a little bit, you know, a little bit with my background, I have enough music to be able to teach something while I'm there. And I taught it the entire semester. So from like October, from almost probably September until December, I was teaching music. And um, I put together like a concert for the kids. It was all virtual because this was around COVID time and stuff, but they still don't have a music teacher at the school. And I can't do that full time. Um, I did what I could for that little bit because I, I value music so much and I value art so much that I really wanted to make sure that those kids had that opportunity. Um, but yeah, it's just hard to find music teachers. It's hard to find art teachers. And it's not necessarily hard to find them because they do exist. It's just hard because right now the education system, like you said, really doesn't value it as much as it. Yeah, it's worth saying too, particularly in the UK, that those teachers who are essentially full-time artists teaching art in schools often have quite a difficult time trying to organise their teaching around their full-time art practice because quite often the school timetables don't really accommodate two to three days off when a class has lessons three to four days a week. Is that something you see over there? It For the school that I'm at, it's very small, so I can only speak to that one um, being that it is a part-time position, so it is not a full-time thing. Um, so it's not going to have the benefits of a full-time position. And so I think that that's something that can make finding somebody to fit that very challenging. Um, but it is only a specific amount of days. I think it's, I think it was two and a half days when I taught there for teaching everyone. Music. Okay, so there was something that worked in that case. Michael, do you find any of your art friends interested in going into schools to educate students or is it something they feel less confident doing? Uh, most, most of my friends uh, are, teaching, <laughs> are teaching art, but they don't have enough. They don't have enough jobs uh, to, and they don't make enough. And like I would say, it's part time uh, because and also what they have to teach when you have an MFA, you need a Master of Fine Art, uh, you are basically burdened with systemic information of outdated uh, uh, art history. Uh, uh, you know, I can go on Google and learn all my art in, in industry, uh, all my art history, uh, you know, that I'm interested in. But first of all, I need to be induced into am i interested in painting music or whatever whatever i resonate with to find myself and then i can look for myself and 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 the art education is to completely outdated it's it's what's systemically relevant like products and who had the best products you know van gogh is a great artist i never would i never would say he isn't but it's not about art it's about his product and it's about his suffering of life, but it is really not saying anything about his process. And it doesn't help me. I need to learn how to paint like Van Gogh for my, in my, in my uh, expression that I become the next Van Gogh. I cannot look at, at, at old stuff. I can look at it as a reference, but that's why I always say, go do your art. And once you get get good, then look at the art history, who, we, who you compare to, then study that artist. Yeah, I think that's a good word of advice. Would you have any particular tips for teachers listening to the show tonight, thinking about redesigning their art curriculum for the new academic year, Michael? Oh, endless. I wrote it in my book. Uh, I, I, I am working on a, 
I told you I worked with uh, one a general education and then art education. I, I, as a matter of fact, I got in 2015 when I started it, I got a grant for making an alternative uh, uh, art education. So I'm very much involved, and they can you know contact me through your uh, show. Uh, it's it's uh, you know it, it. I'm very very in this, and and I can literally explain why that is important and why it's not important, and then you can tell me oh. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking for the human centric way of education, especially art education. I'm not looking for the systemic way. And also the MFA is one of the worst uh, uh, certificates you can have. You can be a curator for a, a, a museum. You can be, I mean, the jobs are not fulfilling really. You're not gonna be, you know, have that to be the best next artist. And a lot of people have MFA, MFA that are artists, but it is not, a, you know, most people go in business or do something else. Yeah, so there's, there's something that needs to be done in terms of the redesign of qualifications, perhaps, mm -hmm. and the promises that are being made to those people uh, entering those courses. Absolutely. I think that's a, a good point to make. Abigail, any thoughts to close from you on what art teachers might be thinking about as they go about redesigning their curriculum or writing teachers or primary teachers? Um, I think that it's important to let the kids be themselves and figure out who they are as they are growing up. I think that's something that we really get to see them learn and grow so much within a school year um, that it's such a privilege to be able to like kind of witness that and aid and help and serve and teach in that capacity so i think education is such uh, i think in a different place in the u.s than it is in the uk right now um so it's hard to say something that would be equally important for both. But I think that it's just important sometimes to kind of hear that, you know, what you do in the world matters and to continue to learn and grow yourself as well as aiding and teaching and um, doing the best for what you can for your students. Okay, well, Thank you very much, Michael and Abigail, for your contributions tonight. It's been both challenging and uplifting to hear your accounts of neurodiverse creativity and of the ways in which education might adapt to better recognise the different ways in which human creativity might be unlocked. I wish you every success with your ongoing creative projects for the rest of the year. So thank you very much indeed. Same here. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks to Abigail and Michael Magrucha for being such excellent guests this evening. I hope their words have given you an insight into how you might help your numerous students maintain the flame of creativity as they negotiate the final weeks of the academic year before they begin a new in the autumn. It's time for a fresh start to language learning. Pearson Edexcel's new student-centred French, German and Spanish 2024 GCSEs cater to the needs of all learners, regardless of their background, ability or reason for studying. Rooted in learned language knowledge, their assessments are transparent and accessible, allowing all students to showcase their language skills. Through inclusive and relatable content, the new Pearson Edexcel MFL GCSEs build a shared cultural capital that helps students develop an understanding of and appreciation for the wider world. Find out more at go.pearson.com forward slash MFL GCSE 24. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and wellbeing tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. Well, that's brought us to the end of another show. So thanks again to my guests, Abigail Griebelbauer and Michael McGrutcher. Thanks to everyone who has tuned in 
Tonight, do check out our other Teachers Talk radio shows this week. Darren Lester is discussing the cultural capital chasm in language learning with a panel of guests from Pearson at 7.30 tomorrow evening. Sounds like essential listening to me. You can catch up on anything you've missed with our excellent and ever-growing panel of teacher presenters at www.ttradio.org. And if you have something you want to say or ask others about education here in the UK or further afield, then perhaps you should consider applying to join the station as a show host. We are always on the lookout for those with current or recent experience of the classroom and other less familiar educational settings. Details can be found on our website, www.ttradio.org. That's all from me for this month. Thank you for listening. I wish you and your students good luck as academic year 2022-23 draws to a close. And I look forward to speaking to you again in July. Goodbye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.